The word of God is powerful. The word of God is strong. The word of God has all you need to have all your needs met. Join us for another life-changing journey into God's word as our set man, Pastor Paul Illo, brings to you today's message. Welcome to The Higher Place UK. Would you mind if it's time for uh, the reading of God's Word, just in honor of the reading of God's Word? Let's make it different, let's do something different today. And if you have your Bibles, uh, please open to the book of John chapter 1, whether that's a half copy or a soft copy <laughs> on your phone's whereabouts. Let's open to John chapter 1, and I'll read verse 1. I'm reading, I'm reading two, script, uh, two portions of the, of the scripture for the foundation for the message. Well, that, the first one is John 1, 1, the second one is 7 Timothy. 3, 14 to 17. So John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we do know that that Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The second place we are reading from is 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. This is Paul talking to Timothy. He said, But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true. For you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And I think it's a, it's a note to parents there, really, because it is good to teach your, 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 your kids the Bible, teach them Scriptures. Paul was making reference to the teaching that was given to Timothy by his mother, um, Eunice, and his grandmother, Louise. Um, and I kind of remember this principle when I went ahead and bought some flashcards for my children. It's got Bible verses all over the place. It is good for us to teach children scriptures. And Paul went on to say that they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes from trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Before you, before you take your seats, uh, I want to tell you the topic for this message. It is called a revival of Bible habits. A revival of Bible habits. Because the thing, the thing is that my prayer is that this series will not just be a kind of series where we just hear messages, sermons and all that, but that will experience revival um, in this series and that we continue to experience it. Because most times people see revival as just a one-time event, but really God's picture is that we continue to experience it because revival is about making something alive, keeping it alive, and giving more life. The continuity is where the change is. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this word today. Would you bring forth your word in a clear way, and Lord, let everybody receive it, let there be no distractions, both here and online, speak your word today. Let your Holy Spirit bring this word beautifully. In Jesus' name we we'll pray. Yeah. Amen. Please take your seats. Thank you. Most of us have similar goals. You know, at the beginning of the year, we all set goals. Can you give me some, some examples of goals that people set at the beginning of the year? Are you a team manager? You know this. What are some of the goals that people set at the beginning of the year? To get fit. To get fit, yes. To lose some weight or gain some weight like me. Who else? <laughs> What are some of the goals that people set at the beginning of the year? Save some money. To save some money, financial goals. So there's fitness goals, financial goals. What more? Spiritual goals. Yeah, some people set spiritual goals. Yeah. So yeah, we all want to we all want to do well in some ways at the beginning of the year. We set goals. And when you look at those goals, the similarity between all the goals is that they have, they have goals that people are setting to win in some ways, to grow in some ways, to get more in some ways. And uh, we do all have similar goals, but the thing is that we get, we get different results. Same goals but different results. And this is because people don't rise to the level of their goals, they fall to the level of their habits. They fall to the level, to the level of their habits. And this is very important, not just in your personal goals, but also when it comes to goals about growing in God, experiencing more of God. People do not rise to the level of their goals they fall to the level of their habits. And what you find is that the difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is just their habits. It's the habits. Because what you find is that successful people, successful people do consistently 
what other people do occasionally. They do it once in a while. And uh, it is very true. We are, we are products of habits. We are products of habits. And really, when you look at your own life, think about your life, you will see that your mornings, or most of your mornings, are usually the same. At least for me. Most of my mornings are usually the same. Maybe not every day, but most of my mornings are the same. And it's the same with your evenings as well. And that, that's what happens to us most days. We are products of automatic habits. But most times, what happens with automatic is that you don't often get, you don't drift towards healthy. It's very easy to drift towards, uh, towards lack of growth. It takes intentionality to create new habits and um, make space for, for culture in your Some years ago, I decided that I wanted to cut down on sugar. I know some of you are judging me right now. <laughs> so you have of sugar are judging, me, are judging me right now. But I was just trying my best to set some, some goals around the, sh the kind of sugar I take in, the amount of sugar I take in. So I will still have ice cream, chocolate, here and there. Um, and I hope that makes you happy. <laughs> but really, today, if I, if I take sugar with my coffee, for instance, I will feel the difference. I will feel like this, there's something wrong. Because over the years, I've been able to build a pattern in, in, in that area. So that I've been able to build habits uh, in, 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 in relation, to, relation to that. A while back as well, I decided to define my wins in life. To decide what am I going to live for? What, what, are, what are the things that will mark success in my life? And um, I, I did some, some, some goal setting in that regard. Set some uh, goals around parenting. So I said that as a, as a, as a parent, when I'm not out of the country, my goal is that I want to take my, my kids to bed minimum of five times a week. So if I'm in the country, I would be present for their bedtime minimum of five times a week, whatever, whatever the pressure is from anywhere else. And I've been able to do that consistently. And I think it's just habits, it's decisions that, that, that you make that determines your destiny. But over time, what happens is that small habits have a way of building up. Over time, there is an accumulation of small habits that begin to change who you are, that begin to determine who you are. And that doesn't mean that because it's a habit, it becomes easy. No. It's just that it becomes a part of you, and it just flows effortlessly, and it happens effortlessly. People ask me as well, they say, how are you able to leave the church on top of all the things that you do? I think it is just, it's just habits. Habits are powered by the help of the Holy Spirit. And I like to always have through the love of the Holy Spirit because it is not by power, it is not by might, it is by the Spirit of God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Experts say that it takes like anywhere from 18 to 254 days to form a new habit. And it takes an average of 66 days for a new behavior to become automatic. Yeah, to become automatic. And over time, the accumulation of those habits determine who we are. We begin to form a personality out of the habits that we build together over and over again. So, I'm not sure we can talk about making room for God or talking about revival without talking about habits. And I'm not talking about the power of positive thinking, but really asking the Holy Spirit to help us change our habits and some of the automatic behaviors that we set up consciously and unconsciously over the years. And most of the people who have experienced God greatly will tell you that. In their life, there are some things that they do consistently. There are habits that are already set in place for them to reap the results that they are reaping today. So I want, to, I, want to, I want us to focus this message on Bible habits. Because that's a major way that we commune with God. That's a major way that we get to experience God. And I found that spiritual growth and spiritual power is always linked to consistent communion with God. Always. And today there are so many interpretations of the Bible, there are so many versions of the Bible, so many approaches to the Bible, and really this is something that forms a key part and underlying bedrock for people to experience with God. So it is a critical part of our work with God, the way we handle the Bible, the way we handle the scriptures. Very important, very, very crucial. If you've never been in church before, or if you are new to faith, maybe here or online, one key component of church services is that we get to read from the Word of God. We get to teach from the Word of God. And if you're, if you're even new to life books, for instance, one key component of ESPN is that you get to open the scriptures when you have your life groups. So it is a critical part of our faith and our faith experience. And the habits that we form around the Bible is integral to experiencing more of God. 
But one major challenge, though, is what you see in what is known as the hermeneutical cycle. Are we together? Yeah. So the, the challenge is that when we when we go to the Bible, we go with our pre-understanding. So if this is if this is the Bible, if this is the Bible, everyone who comes to the Bible, whatever you are, whatever your work is, whatever state you are in your work with God, whether you are new to faith, old, old in faith, whatever category, you all come with a pre-understanding. So this is you. You come to the Bible with your experiences. You come to the Bible with your thoughts, with your patterns, with things that you've accumulated for years, you know, ways of thinking, uh, thought processes, behaviors, customs, whether that's cultural behavior, whether that's whatever it is, you come to the Bible with an existing pre-understanding. And because we are products of habit, sometimes our pre-understanding of course has been formed with years and, and layers and layers of, of habits and patterns. And it becomes difficult for us to go to the Bible with a desire to let the Bible change us. So what happens is that we go to the Bible and we go without understanding or we stay the same. And we repeat that cycle, go to the Bible with your free understanding and you go through it over and over and over again and you stay the same because you are approaching the Bible with your free understanding. You are interpreting the, the Word of God with your free understanding. You are interpreting the stories in the Bible with your free understanding. And we are not allowing the Holy Spirit to bring it to life for us. But really, where the change is, is that we come to the Bible, so this is the Bible, don't forget. We come to the Bible and we submit our pre-understanding to the Word of God and we are changed every time we come. We are transformed. We are changed into a different image. And the more you bring yourself, your humble self to the Word of God, the more you are changed, the more you are transformed. Through the help of the Holy Spirit, the more you are changed. And you do not stay the same, or you are what? You are changed. Amen to that? Amen. You are changed because you are coming with a desire to know more of God. And there should be a change happening each time we come to the Word of God. Each time we gather together to hear the Word of God, there should be a change. I mean, people have said this a lot. In my own experience, I could go to a text in the Bible that I've read for 10 years and I've, I've just had different interpretations. And I go again and I get a fresh perspective, total, totally different the next time you go. Because you're going with a fresh, a fresh desire to know more from God. And to get the best from God's word, we need to form habits that allows the Bible to speak to us in fresh ways, instead of all speaking to the Bible. So I think the key question is, are we allowing the scripture to shape us into the image that God wants, or are we going to the scriptures with an already formed concept, and we are changing scripture into our own image? Yeah. So that's the key question. Are we allowing the scripture to shape us, or are we shaping scripture into our own image, pre understanding. Yeah. Hebrews 4 12 talks about this powerful. It says, For the word of God is alive. So this is not just letters. This is the word of God. The word of God is alive, it's rich. Sometimes my son, you have a context where you're warning him, please take it easy, stop running around. You're going to fall down. And then he goes around, running around, and then falls down, and then stands up quickly and says, I'm okay, I'm okay. <laughs> But then later on, maybe like five minutes or ten minutes afterwards, you find that it's not okay. He was actually maybe injured or something, but he's trying to just stand up and just say I'm fit and move on with his life. And I think sometimes that is the way we approach the Word of God. That we go to the Word of God, we see something speaking to us, and we jump up and say, That is not for me, I'm okay. And then we move on. And then we stay the same. Because we are not allowing the scripture to change us, to shape us. But the Word of God is alive. It is powerful. So this is not just about information. This is about transformation. It is a life. The broken, the hurt, the lonely, the worried, the low can come to the word of God and be changed and be transformed through an understanding of the grace of Jesus in his word. And this is the medium through which God transforms us. And that is why we give out the Bible. Because we know that people can experience God's power. I'm just reading through the Bible. Somebody walked up to me in the church last week and said, Oh, I want to take a copy of the book for my Muslim friend. And I thought, That's brilliant. 
because this word can really change people's lives. It is sharper than any double edged sword. It's able to cut between the soul and the spirit, between the joint and marrow, and it's able to expose the innermost parts, the hidden parts of your heart. And this is what Paul was telling his, his mentee, uh, Timothy, in, in the book of 7 Timothy 3.16. Paul said, all scripture, all scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, whatever it is, all scripture is inspired by God. It's inspired by God. It is a word that God sent to us and is still speaking today. And it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. In other words, there are things that are wrong in our lives that God wants to change through His Word. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Do you want revival? Allow God's Word to shape you. Allow God's Word to correct you. You want revival. I think most times people think of revival as that spectacular big moment that happened in, in the body of Christ or moments in the history, in history that changed the world. That's that part of it. But sometimes revival is in the little little things and the little little habits that we form. Because those are those are habits that are sustainable and able to get in, get us on this race for the long haul. And that is why the psalmist prayed in Psalm 119 verse 37. He says, Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. My life can be preserved. I can be refreshed for the journey ahead because of my encounter with the word of God. And there's no way that we can remove this from our Christian experience. There's no way we can remove an interaction with the word of God from our Christian experience. It is central to our faith. It is central to our faith experience. It is the key to experience the more of God. In the West, sometimes I find that we take the word of God for granted. We take it for granted because we have it all over the place. We have it in hard copies, we have it, we have it on the phones, we have it all over the place. And that wasn't that the, the Bible is not always was not always available. And in fact, in some parts of the world, they don't even have the Bible in their local language. There's a video that is all over the place on the, on the internet of a, an Indonesian tribe that when they saw the translated version of the New Testament, the first time they saw it, they were so ecstatic, they were so, they were so excited because they were able to handle the word of God in their language. And today we take that for granted because we have the Bible all over the place. But really, that, was, that wasn't always the case. I think the big breakthrough happened in 1455 when the printing press was invented by Gothenburg and, and it became possible to, to hand over the Bible to the masses. And today with the help of uh, Bible apps like the U version, like Bible app, you get to see Bible all over the place. But sometimes we still fail to interact with the Bible Bible because the fact that something is helpful doesn't mean that people will always gravitate towards it. Yeah. So what I want to do this point anyway is to make it plain and simple so that we can begin to form some new Bible habits and grow in our experience of God. The first thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to use some figures, figures of speech. I'm going to use simile uh, to present what the Bible can do, what God's Word can do in our lives when we create new habits around it. So let's look at the first section together. The Bible is like nutrients and water for a plant. The Bible is like nutrients and water for a plant. Without it, you're going to be stunted and you're going to starve. The Bible is like nutrients and water for a plant. Like all kinds of things here. So if this is a plant, this is a, this is a fake one. <laughs> if this is a plant, the Bible is like nutrients and water for that plant to thrive and, 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 and uh, do well. So if you are like a plant, it is God's word that comes on you, that the word that you take in, that makes you strong, that makes you potent, that makes you thrive. Yeah. And think about a plant. Say if you, if you water this plant once a month or once a year, will it grow? No. And the more, the more we are watered by the word of God, through the help of the Holy Spirit, the more we are changed, the more we grow, the more we blossom. And if we do not allow God's word to strengthen us, to nourish us, we will eventually, our spiritual life will eventually shrivel and die. And so sometimes we live like this in the sense that many of us take God's word in just once in a month, once in a week. But that is not enough to build a sustainable pattern of growth in our work with God. How would you look if you feed your body once a week? Many of us cannot even last <laughs> three hours without eating. <laughs> How would we look? And it's the same thing. That's what we are doing to our spirit man. We are feeding our spirit man once 
a week. And that is not enough. That is not enough for ongoing transformation, consistent refreshing, revival. Many people feed their bodies three odd meals a day and they feed their spirit one cold snack a week. And we complain that we are not revived. Yeah. Your soul needs the water of the world. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Your soul needs the nourishment that the book can provide. And that's why the psalmist prayed. In Psalm 119 verse 25, he says, I, I lie in the dust. Revive me by your word. God's word is an agent of revival. Revive me by your word. I told you my plans and you answer. Now teach me your decrees. What do you think will happen when we come to the text like that? Lord, teach me your decrees. We are going to be changed when we pray like this. We are going to be transformed. Help me to understand the meaning of your commandments. And I will meditate on your wonderful deeds. I weep with sorrow. Encourage me by your word. Keep me from lying to myself. Give me the privilege of knowing your instructions. It is beautiful. It is powerful. The Bible is like nutrients and water for our lives. Number two, the Bible is like a charger connected to a power source. The Bible is like a charger connected to a power source. And I like the fact that I said connected to a power source because it's not just a charger. This is a charger. You can't do anything just like this. When it's connected to a power source, it is powerful. And when you connect it to a phone, then something begins to happen. The Bible is like a charger connected to a power source. And then, if you imagine yourself as a phone, when you connect the, to, the, to the charger and the power source, you begin to get charged and revived. The more you connect with it, the more you are revived. The more you are transformed. Of what use is a phone if it is not charged? It's of no use. And do you charge your phone once a week? No, you charge it consistently because you want it to be alive. And even the phones with the best batteries in the world need to be charged. There are some phones that if you charge them, they can last for, for 24 hours, whatever. But even at that, it still needs to continually come and be charged and be transformed and be transformed. With all the potentials of a phone, look at all these smartphones today. There are endless possibilities. You can use your phone to do any, almost anything today. With all the possibilities of a phone, if it is not charged, then it's not able to maximize its potential. And this is how many of us live our lives. We live our lives not coming to the Word of God to be charged, to be transformed, and uh, we stay the same. I like the prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples in John chapter 17, verse 17. He says, dedicate them to yourself. Revive them by the means of the truth. Your Word is truth. So in other words, the more we come to God's word, the more we are revived, the more we are transformed, the more we are changed. Number three, the Bible is like a mirror. I came ready for you today. <laughs> the Bible is like a mirror. <laughs> do you go looking at a mirror and do nothing? Do nothing with what you see. Ladies, you go to the mirror and you begin to make adjustments. <laughs> you begin to paint your face. <laughs> Praise God. The Bible is like a mirror. Without it, we won't be able to see ourselves as we truly are. Yeah. We won't be able to make adjustments without it. We won't be able to see ourselves as we truly are. Honestly, how many of you have read the Bible and felt convicted by something that you read? Ever? Yeah. That's the Bible. It's a mirror. So when we look at the mirror, we are changed. Because when we look at the mirror, we obey God's word, we are able to make adjustments. And we look different after changing, after making the adjustments. Yeah, the function of the mirror is to show us accurately what we look like. Or the time when it was complete, there's no mirror in our house. We're gonna buy a mirror. I thought, yeah, I'm just, I'm just fine. I'm gonna just have my Bible out. But she wanted to be able to make adjustments on the face and put all the foundation and all the, all the essentials. As the function of the mirror is to show us accurately who we are, what we look like, so that we can make necessary changes. So the function of the Bible is also to accurately show us the state of our spirit, not necessarily, necessarily the, the, the state of our faith, but the state of our spirit man. And with God's help, we can begin to make the necessary adjustments. And that's why it's important that we go to the world as a mirror. And when we see something that doesn't look right, we allow the Holy Spirit to make that change so that we are being transformed. We are being transformed. As we behold this mirror, we are being transformed. James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25 says that 
But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing your face at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect Lord that sets you free, and if you do what he says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. There is a blessing to that. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So the Bible is like a mirror. It is like a mirror. And really for refreshing and continuous revival, we've got to continually experience the power in the Word of God and submit ourselves. I think one of the challenges, we were talking about this yesterday, one of the challenges with the post-pandemic church is that everything is online these days. So you can just go and turn on the, the, turn on the sermon that you want to hear on the Sunday morning and pick at you. This one is not good for me. You go to the next one and you keep flipping, keep it flipping. But really that is not good for our development because God sends His Word and He heals us and delivers us and we are refreshed and revived on a continual basis. Amen to that. Amen. The Bible is also like a weapon. The Bible is like a weapon. <laughs> the Bible is like a weapon. <laughs> it's able to cut anything. This is from George. George Daniel. He, brought it, he made this for school. I thought this is a good one. That's PSA. <laughs> the Bible is like a weapon. Yeah. It is able to cut anything and uh, you can use it to fight the battles of life. Yeah. It is called the sword of the spirit. In, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul was talking about the armor of God and he made reference to the sword of the spirit. You can't fight some things just with the physical, with the physical, uh, physical weapons. Ephesians 6 verse 17 says, put on salvation as your helmet and take, I like that, take it, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Can we say that together? The word of God. Take it. Even though it is just there, you take it, step into it, take the soul of the spirit and cut and divide. I like that. Cut it, divide, divide situations with the word of God. Understand situations with the word of God. Yeah. Take the soul of the spirit. Yeah. Take the soul of the spirit. And what happens is that you see the Holy Spirit, when we go to the word of God with the determination and the desire to experience God, the Holy Spirit has a way of quickening words. To meet particular situations, to meet the need of the hour. You can quicken that and use it in various situations. And you can begin to even pray with the word. You can begin to act on the word. Because God's mind is act over your situation and you can apply it to your situations. So think about the word of God is that it's able to speak to every situation. God, there's something about every situation in the Bible that God can use for your situation. For debt, for, fact, for marriage, for finances. For thirst, for, 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 for whatever it is, for church. And many times in, in churches, people vote between the word and the spirit. Why do we need both? We need both. We need both the word and the spirit. The next book of God will be all about the word of God and the spirit of God. Both, not just one. Yeah. Can you say amen to that? Amen. The Bible is like a weapon. And lastly, on that, on that first part, the Bible is like an instruction manual. It's, a, it's like an instruction manual. Yeah. Without it, you don't know how to successfully navigate life. Without it, you don't know how to successfully navigate the Christian experience. I remember a time when I had a flat tire for I think, our current car. Um, and uh, I wasn't so sure about what to do. Normally, I mean, I know how to change tires, like normally. If something happens happen to a car, I know, I know the logistics of what you need to do. But with this particular car, there was something missing. I tried everything to open, you know, to, to, to turn the wheel and all that. It didn't happen. But apparently, there was something in the manual that was missing. And it was not until I went into the manual and started looking and searching that I saw that the tire actually has a key. There's a key to, open, to, to use before you begin to turn around the, the, the wheel and the spanner and all those kind of things. So, I was just there waiting until I found that instruction. There's a manual on my key here. <laughs> The Bible is like a manual for specific situations. And without it, you do not know how to successfully navigate your walk with God. It was until I checked the manual that I was able to see that I needed to do this this way, this that way, before knowing what to do. I like what somebody said. They said the Bible is an acronym for 
basic instructions before leaving Earth. B I B L E. Basic instructions before leaving Earth. Now, before you, in your work with God, God wants to give you basic instructions. He wants to give you specific instructions. And if you don't go into the, into the Word of God, you are not able to successfully navigate this experience. If you are, if you are just about to get married, there's something in God's Word God about it. If you are about to deal with, if you want to deal with a difficult situation, there is something in God's Word about it. If you are dealing with a waiting season, there is something in God's Word about it. And the more you experience God's Word, the more you are transformed, the more you are revived, the more you are changed. And you see, learning to grow spiritually is a, is a long journey. It's a lifelong journey. And that journey happens and uh, gets better and better as we experience God's Word and as we apply God's Word into our life. So, in order for spiritual growth to happen, in order for revival to happen, we must be taught, we must be rebuilt, we must be corrected and trained by the, by the Word of God. Can you say amen to that? That is how revival happens. It happens through consistent engagement with the Word of God. This is how we make room for more. Personal study. Beyond the corporate study, which is brilliant, personal study of God's Word, it is brilliant. And the corporate study is very important. Tomorrow we start a Bible study. Yeah. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> That's a yeah, clap, clap. So it's, it's great to see that many people have joined that, that group. Like 20 people have joined so far. 7 30 p.m. on Zoom every Monday. If you've not registered, please register. Uh, speak to us after the service. That is how we make room for God. You know, there are different translations of the Bible. The, the first one, very close to the original text, the Hebrew text and all that, was the King James, is the King James version. But then there are so many versions like New Living Translation. Uh, the New Living Translation is the first Bible that I read through, all through, and I loved it. And I, I, I've just been recommending that to people. I actually, we actually bought the New Living Translation as well. This one is the New International Version. There is the Good News Translation. There is the Message Translation. All kinds of translations. And it's okay to compare translations so you can get full clarity. It's okay to, to use different versions when you're studying. But please make sure that you are reading the Holy Bible, not something else. Amen? Amen? Yeah, not something else. There are so many additions to the Bible these days. There's something called tribute literature. So there's something called the Epistle of Barnabas. <laughs> the Gospel of Thomas. <laughs> they are just embellishments with no ring of truth. So you, you've got to be very careful. Make sure that you are reading the Bible. The Bible has 66 books. 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. And there is no book like it in terms of its continuity. When you look through the Bible, you can see consistency. You can see that everything is pointing to Jesus. You can see God's redemptive plan for humanity all, all, all over the pages. It's powerful. There's no book like it in terms of its consistency. There is no book like it in terms of its honesty. There is no book like it in terms of its integrity. There is no book like it in terms of its circulation. There is no book like it in terms of its survival. And your life changing power. The grass will wither, the flower will fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. <laughs> Amen. Now, let's talk about habits. Let's talk about revival habits. And I'm going to emphasize a few points to, 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 to bring this all together. Because my goal is that we don't just hear, oh, the Bible is beautiful, the Bible is beautiful, but we actually do something with it. Because it's when we do something with it that we are what? We are changed and transformed. So let's talk about Bible habits because I think this is very crucial. But I think this is what we start with. We start with a desire. And we must start with a desire. Without desire, nothing really happens. And it is good to start with desire. Or, yeah, it is good to start with desire. In a book titled, You Are What You Love, James Speed reminds us that we are not thinking beings, but loving beings. So in other words, we are creatures of passions and desires. Not just about thinking, but what we actually, what we actually desire, what we actually love to do. We desire it, and uh, we get to form habits around that. So that, what that means is that where there is no desire, there can be no new habit. There can be no new habit. So you actually start with the desire. Now, you can have a pre understanding that, oh, there's a part of the Bible that uh, I don't agree with. There's a part of the Bible that are not just for me. So you go to the Bible with that pre-understanding, and so you cannot move further beyond the circle. You stay the same. 
But if you go with a desire and a fresh passion to say, oh, I want to see what God may want to do in my life through this text. And, and that, what happens with that desire is that God begins to work with that desire. Yeah, start with a desire. It has to do, it has to start with a desire to spend more time in God's Word. It has to start with a desire for revival. It has to start with a desire for new habits this year. So that you're asking the Holy Spirit for a new and fresh desire. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Strong desire. It must be present or otherwise there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people without desire. A lack of desire becomes a deadly enemy of spiritual growth. So you may be saying that, I read the Bible already, I read this every day, um, so maybe this is not for me. There's another level that God will want to take you to in your study of his word. And I think the key is that we never arrive. The key is that we never arrive. We, go, we keep going hungry for what God may be trying to show us. We keep going for more of God. And we see a message about desire in Psalm 42. Psalm 42, the Bible says that as the deer, as the deer longs for the streams of water, so I long for you, O God. Can we pray together? So I long for you, O God. I like that. Verse 2, I thirst for God. That is, that is desire. The word thirst and desire, they mean the same thing. I thirst for you, the living God. I thirst for you. I thirst for you. When you look through the book of Psalms, it's actually filled with various prayers about desire. Psalm 63, verse 1. You, God, are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I'm thirsty for you. I want more of you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I thirst for you. So, if one of really have experienced continuous revival, there must be a desire. Great habits do not happen as a product of chance, it is a product of a desire, a consistent thirst for more of God. And the truth is that, see, this desire is not created by willpower. It's created by the, by the power and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we must ask the Holy Spirit to give us fresh desire. Fresh desire for God's Word. Fresh desire to experience God's Word. So that God's Spirit can implant in us. It can, uh, it, can, it, can, it can agitate us. It can strengthen us. It can make us bold. And empower us with a new appetite. Revival starts with a desire. So start with a desire, but number two, start small. Can you say start small? Start small. Start small. Yeah. Aim high, but start small. There may be people here who have never opened God's word during the week before. God is saying to you today, start small. If you've never been reading the Bible, if you've not been reading the Bible at all, meditating on God's word at all, you can start with a verse. You can, you can start with a verse, pick up a verse, and meditate on it. And what will happen is that you will start to see Big changes, small starts, big changes in the way you think, in the way you react, you know, in the way you perceive situations in your life. You could make a decision and say something like, as soon as I wake up, I would read a verse. Before I make coffee, I would read a verse. After I make coffee, I would read a verse. After my, on my way back from school run, I would, I would listen to the audio Bible. That's a desire, that's a habit, that's a pattern that you can start. Yeah, on my way to work, I will read the Bible on the train. Start small, new habits. And you may not feel like doing it consistently at the beginning. And so what would happen, realistically, what would happen is that you may miss a day. If you miss a day, don't miss two. Keep going. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, keep going. And ultimately, you will get to a point where it becomes a habit. Yeah. But number three. I put this one out there for people who are studying God's word already. Maybe one chapter a day or one verse a day. I mean, uh, don't stay small. Yeah. Don't stay small. If you've been reading the verse before, allow God's spirit to, ex to stretch you so you can read more. You can study more. You're not just reading, you can meditate on it. Uh, read a few more. Even if a chapter a day or a few chapters a day. Maybe you can read one chapter in the Old Testament in the morning, one chapter in the New Testament in the afternoon. We've been able to do stuff like that with the uh, with, the, with the plan that we gave you. Is there a copy somewhere there? The, the Bible, Bible reading plan. Yeah. Thank you. The Bible reading plan, there, is, there, is, uh, there are different books that you can study uh, every day. And the way it's done, it starts from 24th of January. But if you're starting on the 31st, for instance, uh, or you're starting on the 1st, maybe, you can just pick it up from there. And you keep going to next year. Uh, whatever day you start, keep reading it. Amen. 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 
Don't stay small. The key is to keep going for more of God. That is the key to revival. I don't just want a one-time revival or one-time revival series, one-time revival message. I want ongoing revival in our lives. That we are changed, we are transformed, we are transformed, we are transformed. The key is to ask the Holy Spirit to keep showing you more, even beyond the letters. Because the letter kills, but the Spirit gives understanding. Yeah. And this, this bit actually entails meditating, pausing, stealing, being, stealing, your, stealing your soul to hear what God is trying to say to you. And each action that you take is a vote to a new identity. It's a vote to a new person. It's a vote for revival. It's a vote for experiencing more of God. Amen. Amen. So don't wake up tomorrow morning and feel like, oh, they said we should study the Bible, so this is an obligation now. No, no, no. Go with a desire. A desire to hear what God will say to you. And a desire to experience the Holy Spirit. What I want to do with the rest of our time is uh, to invite two people forward to share uh, one Bible habit. One Bible habit. Can we help with that microphone? One Bible habit that they've been able to consistently be that has made a difference in their lives. I'm going to have uh, Mola first. Mola, come share any Bible habit. Um, just one Bible habit that you've been able to use over the years. Or recently, or um, recently, it doesn't have to be five days ago. Yeah, definitely more recently. Um, I've been picking like a topic or subject, for example, like mercy or the Holy Spirit, um, and then studying that for like two weeks and targeting scriptures that like maybe talk about the topic that I'm studying. Um, and yeah, just reflecting on that, and then I find that I'm quite consistent in reading the scriptures because it's pertaining to the topic of the week, and I, I feel like it's helping to grow. Um, so that's in a nutshell with my Bible habit, I guess. Brilliant, thank you. Can we appreciate more of that? That could be something you want to start. Holy Spirit, we'll ask you more to explore this week and we'll be studying different books around that. Let's have uh, uh, Miss Nessie come tell us about our own Bible habits. Thank you, Church. Um, recently, um, I've developed that topic, um, meditation, by, through the series, the series, the headings of every uh, series. I make sure, and with this, this has helped me to navigate through the Bible throughout the year. Um, I take notes, I write down quotations, we thank God for technology when I get home. I replay the messages and compare, see, I visualize myself, compare what has been taught with the, the thing I've read in the scriptures, and I visualize myself in that scenario, in that, you know, and ask myself questions and try to find out what the writer of that book, of that passage, wants us to understand. I go through it over and again and in most cases as I find myself in that scenario, I questions to crop up like what would you have done in that circumstance? If you were in that shoe, this person shoe, what would you have said? What would you do? This question trigger prayer points for myself, for the church, and for others. And this has helped me to grow because it's helped me to consistent with prayers and all. So this is how I think. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, and you know the Bible habit has been useful. We hope that you maintain that and also uh, go for more. Don't stay small. Um, start small or don't stay small. Amen to that. Yes. Physically, in order to grow, what do we do? We eat. We eat good food. Spiritually, in order to grow, we must feed on God's word. Yeah. We must go to God's word. And we don't feed on the wrong things, we don't feed on the wrong, wrong doctrine. We feed on the truth of God's word. And it's very interesting that Jesus said that you will know the truth and the truth is set for you. He didn't say you will know the letters or you have head knowledge. 
It says you will know the truth. So as we go to God's Lord, let's pray that God will reveal His truth to us. He will purify us by His truth. He will revive our lives by His truth. Because His word is truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's rise up as we round off on the notes that we started from. I'm going to read John chapter 1, verse 1. Now, remember that the goal of this message is that we don't want a revival that is just in a series, that is just talked about in a series, but a kind of refreshing that happens on an ongoing basis where we are changed as we approach God's word with humility and hunger. So I'm going to round off by reading a few verses that we read at the beginning of God's uh, this of the message, John chapter 1, verse 1, and 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Back in the day, Bible reading used to be a part of the service. Bible reading and prayer, those were two major components of services. But today, it is not, it is, it is, it is, it is being taken away. I think it's beautiful that we are reading God's word together. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And we do know, of course, that that word became flesh in Jesus, full of grace and truth, and it dwelt amongst us. And as we study God's word, we are changed into an image. We will become more and more like Jesus. More and more and more, and more like Jesus until the very end. And Paul also said in 2 Timothy 3, 14-17, But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation. There are some of you here, I feel like God wants me to tell you that you grew up in the in Christian homes where they taught you the Bible, they taught you the Scriptures. But it's like you're, you have all this kind of curiosity trying to look for embellishments to make yourself excited to see what is out there. But God's word is enough. If God's word is not enough, nothing will never be. Not a man, not a woman, not the things of the world, nothing will ever be enough. If Jesus is not enough for you, nothing will ever be enough. Verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. We're going to end this message on a different note today. The first thing I'll do is give the people both here and online the opportunity to ask Jesus to come into their lives. If you want to know God, if you want to dedicate your life to Jesus, this is your opportunity. And we're going to pray together before we end the live stream. And then we're going to give the people in the room an opportunity to pray. We're going to pray together. But if you're online or if you're here, you want to give your life to Jesus. Or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. Will you lift up your hand as we pray together? You want to make a decision to say, I rededicate. Well, maybe God has spoken to you one way or the other as well. So you want to make a decision. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone doing that. Online as well. Do it. Do it. Let's do it together. And because we're in family, we don't pray alone. So right now we pray together. Lord Jesus. Come into my heart today. Make me new. Make me pure. Transform me. I come, me, I come to you with my pre understanding. Change my mindset. Transform me by changing the way I think. And help me to become like Jesus. This is my new beginning in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate.